All right, let's talk about Mr. Descartes. Um, René Descartes was a French philosopher in the early 1600s. Um, I'm sorry, the lighting is really bad, but um, whatever. Uh, he, uh, okay, so we, I skipped hundreds of years um, since my last lecture. Of it's not like nothing happened, uh, but really not that much happened uh, between um, Roman times and 1600, um, the Middle Ages, you know. Um, a couple of things I'd like to note before I get started in the lecture is just, uh, Descartes was uh, a contemporary of Galileo, a younger contemporary, so he was younger than him, but it was that time period. And he was very much a part of that uh, early scientific movement. I mean, he, he did write a book on uh, astronomy that had the, the sun at the center of the solar system. I mean, surprise, uh, that seems like no big deal, but it was then. Um, he wrote a book on optics, which is how your eye works. So, I mean, he was participating in that early scientific um, endeavor and uh, and 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 certainly he was very much well aware of Galileo and what Galileo was doing. Um, he he was also uh, well, you know, Descartes mo definitely most famous for his mathematics. He came up with the Cartesian coordinate system, which you probably all know the Cartesian coordinate system. You all learned that. Um, I Google it. You'll see what I'm talking about if you don't even if you don't know already. So he was a mathematician, and that coordinate system was it's a lot more important than you think it is. That's what led to calculus. Um. Anyway, so at this time, philosophy was very much dominated by the scholastic tradition, which essentially is. Aristotle plus Christian the theology. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's the context in which he's working here is almost everybody was a, was a scholastic uh, philosopher. Again, Aristotle plus Christian, Christian theology. We're in, we're in France, okay? Um, not all over the world, but in Europe. Um, I'm going to skip some things here, and I want to highlight some of the most important points. Um, now, it is true that when he was approaching his philosophy, and here we're definitely talking about epistemology most of all, but metaphysics as well, which are always tied together. He did, uh, he did strive or try to uh, enlist a mathematical model, okay? Um, and in, even more specifically, it was a, a model based upon um, geometry, you know? So geom in geometry, you have axioms and then postulates. And he, he wanted to do this kind of this this kind of thing. So um, in place of axioms in his philosophy, he wanted what he was looking for was what he called first principles, right? And those first principles had to have certainty. Uh, at least that's that was his conception. Because if you're going to try to build up a knowledge base, which this so epistemology here, we're talking about constructing knowledge. Uh, you need to begin with things that are absolutely certain. And those are like the axioms. Um, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, that kind of thing, right? Only now we're talking about knowledge in general. And so he wants, he wants, to, he wants to establish certainty. Um, other things he was striving for were order and simplicity. And also uh, clear and distinct ideas. 
um, which by the way, he uses that phrase, clear and distinct ideas all the time, which, which is kind of ironic because what he means by that is neither clear nor distinct. <laughs> His scholars have been kind of arguing about what is that? What does he mean by clear and distinct ideas? I think the one, the, the interpretation that I, uh, I find most compelling on this is it's a clear and distinct idea is there's nothing more or less than the object about which it's about. So it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not encompassing more in the idea than should be there. And it's not, um, it's not, it, and it's capturing the entire idea. Again, that's still really vague. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not that clear and distinct. Uh, just, I just want to note that because you'll see that phrase clear and distinct ideas all the time in his writing. And it's not really at all obvious what that's supposed to mean. All right. I'm going to pause for a second before I go into the method of doubt because that first principles and certainty thing Okay, this is the first thing that you have to understand about Descartes and his importance, because he came up with this idea, which is called foundationalism. Um, I mean, that's generally attributed to him and probably rightly so. And it's this no, it, the notion here is <laughs> that knowledge needs a base. It needs a foundation. It needs a groundwork. You'll see those terms, those different terms used by all kinds of different philosophers. This is a very popular idea even to this day. Uh, probably most philosophers are still foundationalists. It's this idea that knowledge needs a foundation, a basis, a starting point, and you build from that foundation. Um, which and that foundation has to be something like first principles and certainty. Um, other philosophers will say other things, um, as we'll see. Like the empiricists think the foundation is much more about your senses, for instance, and your um, and empirical data. Not so much for Descartes. He wasn't about. He wasn't. Yet, he's not that much about empirical data. But. But this whole idea that you have to have a foundation, a beginning, a starting point, and you build your knowledge on top of it. Like, it's not like knowledge is a bunch of stuff just floating around all over the place. You need to have a groundwork and then you build up from there. This is a Cartesian idea and it's, it's very uh, influential and very important in philosophy. All right. So in order to find that foundation, he wants to find certainty, okay? His first principles have to be certain. So how does he find that? Well, it, he does it by a sort of process, process of elimination uh, tactic because he's like, okay, if I wanna find something certain, I'm gonna doubt, doubt everything I can doubt, all right? So this is Descartes' famous method of doubt, okay? He's trying to find certainty and rid himself of preconceived ideas. One thing, it's, this is theoretical, it's not practical, okay? He's trying, to, this is a mental exercise. Um, he's not denying, well, let's say, let's put it this way. He's not saying all these things are false. He's just saying, can I doubt these these things? Can I doubt these things? If I can doubt these things, then they're not the certainty that I need to start my enterprise of finding first principles. So I need to, uh, um, I'll, I'm going to doubt whatever I can and whatever's left over, that's the things that cannot be doubted. So he's not saying any of this is false. Um, people uh, misconstrue this. Um, and it, it, a lot of people think that Descartes is a skeptic and he's not really a skeptic. He's using this skeptical enterprise to find his certainty. 
he's looking for, he's using it to locate these first principles. All right. Now there's three phases to this method of doubt that he uses. Um, the first, the first, they build upon one another. I say phases because they're they're not distinct. They build on one another. They you know they build up. So step one, there's the possibility of error in your senses in particular. Okay, this has to do with your senses and your perceptions. That is seeing, hearing, touching, that kind of thing. And, you know, there's the stick in the water example. That's, man, that's ancient. I mean, it goes back forever. Like you put, a, you put a stick in the water, it looks bent. It's not really bent. Descartes uses a bunch of other examples, like a tower far away looks uh, square, but when you get close, it's round or the opposite, I can't remember. Um, the sun, he says the sun looks small, but it's actually much larger than the earth. I mean, it's just that your senses don't communicate to you uh, the correct information all the time. So some of your perceptions are false some of the times. Um, look, I mean, this is this is pretty uh, mundane. I mean, this is pretty uh, unobject <laughs> unobjectionable. I mean, look. This is the whole basis of magic. <laughs> like people that trick your senses into thinking things disappear or rabbit comes out of a hat or whatever. There's all kinds of cases where your senses don't give you accurate information. Um, and you think you see one thing and you, or you think you see something, it's not really true. You think you, uh, your sense of smell changes when you're sick. You know, there's all sorts of, of, of examples of times when your senses don't give you accurate information or they give you conflicting information or things like this. So this is not that big of a deal, it, but this is only phase one. Okay, uh, he just introduces this and he, he actually says, maybe if your senses deceive you one time, you should never trust them again, something like that. And uh, that's a hint to where he's going with this. Um, and then he introduces the dream argument, which is probably pivotal. Um, the dream argument is that people have vivid dreams. Now, I'm not even sure if this is true about everybody. It, it actually is true about me, I, I do. Um, where you dream something is happening and while you're and while you're dreaming, when you're in the dream, it seems totally real, but it's not real. I mean, nothing's hap Nothing in the dream is real. Now, be careful here. It is. It's definitely true that you are dreaming. That's true. But what you're dreaming is not true. If I'm dreaming that I'm making out with a supermodel or something. I'm not, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I, the dream, what I'm dreaming is false. The fact that I'm dreaming is true, but the, what I'm dreaming, that whole world is like a false, it's like a whole, it's all false. I'm not really flying in the air or whatever I'm dreaming. And in this case, all your perceptions is, it's sort of like, you know, you're feeling things, you're seeing things. You even, uh, sometimes you even smell things in dreams. You know, your, your perceptions, they're all false. But this, but Descartes does concede that this is only sometimes true because it's only when you're, it's only when you're dreaming. I mean, he's not say Descartes does not say that you're dreaming all the time. He actually does say, however, how are you supposed to distinguish between when you're dreaming and not dreaming at any given moment you could be dreaming. Like while, while you're watching this video, you could be dreaming right now, you know, or having a nightmare that you have, you have to take a philosophy class, whatever. It, in this particular moment, how do you distinguish between when you're dreaming and not dreaming? But, you know, he does not say you're always dreaming until the next, until the next thing. <laughs> 
because that oh by the way i should note that even in, he thinks that even in a dream certain things are true even in dreams and that like uh universals are still true that kind of goes back to, to uh plato where you can dream of a tree that tree you're dreaming of does not exist but trees like the universal trees that is true um that really exists and he also thinks that mathematics is true in dreams you can't no, even in dreams two plus two is four and a triangle has three sides so there are certain things even he thinks are even true in dreams now uh the third stage is when we get really radical okay and this is the evil demon argument okay or the evil deceiver argument some uh, depends on the translation you get um this is there's various versions of this this is his version but um subsequent philosophers you know like in the after him um have come up with other versions of this and it's like the brain in the vat that's this that it's it's pretty much exactly the same argument and by the way the matrix the matrix is the same argument this is the same concept uh, for for descartes it's the evil demon deceiver but um in the matrix it's it's the machines but it's all kind of the same idea and that is that there's a, he he says there's an maybe there's an evil demon uh deceiving me all the time about everything um this demon has godlike powers he can make me think that i'm living in the, this real you know real world but i'm actually not i'm just he's just deceiving me about everything i uh, nothing i perceive nothing i think is true is true he's just making me see things hear things that aren't even there all right and same this is the same concept as the matrix right because when you're in the matrix nothing you're perceiving in the matrix is real you're like if you were really in the matrix you're like that thing in your head and you're like sitting in a pod and you think you're going out to dinner and doing things you're not all right the whole world is a complete illusion this is the third step and obviously the most radical step in his method of doubt okay so if that like like i said it's he's not saying this is true he's saying it could be so i can it could be true so i'm going to doubt i'm going to doubt my senses i'm going to doubt the i'm going to doubt all this because who knows maybe i'm being deceived all the time what can i be sure of even in that situation well what i can be sure of is congito ergo sum which you may have heard of uh associated with him and that's just latin for i think therefore i am i think therefore i am this is certainly the most uh uh famous thing that descartes ever said i think therefore i am he calls this his archimedean point it just i, I won't go into why that says that anyway um okay so but what am i am i a body or am i a soul by the way descartes thinks of soul as being mind and soul for descartes are the same thing and that's not true of, of everybody it, it, this is this is kind of a cartesian uh thing because um uh he he, he completely makes the, mind and soul they're equivalent in descartes they're not they're not universally uh equivalent in philosophy or other people but he does okay so just keep that in mind mind and soul are the same thing so am i body or am i a soul and and and, he, and then he go, he says well my hands and my arms and all my uh 
I have, uh, you know, and all the feelings I get from, and when I look in the mirror or whatever, that's one thing. And then I have thoughts and sensations on the other hand. And he's, and his claim here is that um, the, your body belongs to the disputed, like the, the doubted part. Again, think of the matrix. Uh, when you're in the matrix, that's not your real body. Your real body is sitting in a pod somewhere. Your, bo your body in the matrix is all false, right? And this is, this is the same way that Descartes is thinking about this. But your thoughts and your sensations, now they are the same, okay? And so he's, he's, he wants to argue that what he's sure of is that he's a thinking thing. He's a thinking thing. He has a mind and he can think. He doesn't know if his body exists. He knows that he can think and sense and have feelings and things like that. That's all he knows is that his mind exists, not his body. And this brings me to the second uh, point. The first one was foundationalism, but the second point here is this distinction between mind and world. Okay, now this is a very, very key distinction in philosophy. So many philosophers, uh, I mean, well, I'll just say the majority. I don't, I, I haven't done a poll here, but most philosophers think that Descartes is on to something with this distinction between mind and body. And in more generally mind and world, your body is part of the world, okay? Um, your mind is, and your mind is off separately. And what you're trying to do is get your mind, how does your mind connect with your body, connect with the world? right? How does your mind connect with your body and then connect with the world? So your mind is like, you're off in your mind and you're trying to reach out to the world to find out what is going on outside of you. Um, so, you know, you know how, so given this idea, you know how the world seems set aside the set aside the matrix and the evil demon and everything else you know how the world seems to be to you i mean you know what color this seems to look like you know what uh that it, this seems to taste like you know how things seem to you but that's all in your mind how, is that really is that really the way the world is is that really the color that thing is is that it is the world the way that it seems to be is the world the way that it seems to be descartes method of doubt has really challenged this it's like how do you really know that the world is the way that it seems to be all right i mean you have ideas but it what about the things out in the world? Are they the way, do they match up? Do they match up with the idea you have in your mind about them? All right. So this is a huge conundrum. Are things the way they seem to be? How does your mind reach out and grasp, grasp the world around you, All right? Um, and how do you connect your thoughts and ideas to the things that you are experiencing in an appropriate way? Um, and again, I, I, I want to just reiterate, this is, you don't even, you don't have to believe in the matrix or the evil demon argument to question this. I mean, even if you reject that and think that's ridiculous, it's still a question. Like, when I have an idea of something, how am I sure that it's true of the thing? What, a, you know, like, when I think something is a certain color or, well, you know, anything, how do I know that my idea is actually matching up, you know, matching up? 
with the thing I'm thinking about in that it's really like that. I mean, all I've got is my ideas. I can't step out. I cannot step out of myself and compare my idea to the thing. There's no way to do that. All right, to be continued in a moment. 